because we often play so small. Who am I? Philip McKernan's voice internally, and still is there to some extent, and will probably never go away, but was with the roaring voice that I had in my head was, who the fuck do you think you are? Who the fuck do you think you are? You insignificant thing that's just, can you, you can't even read a book. How do you think, gonna, how do you think you're going to affect somebody else's life? That is the voice that most of us have in this world. Most of us don't like who we are. Because, and, and, we, and we say, well, no, I do, I do. Of course I love who I am or I like who I am or respect who I am. But that's because you're staying so busy. But most of us don't have a very high appreciation of who we are. And therefore, we look at life and we, we, we measure ourselves and we, we give ourselves the permission to consider what's possible based on the image that we hold for ourselves. And the saying that I have that I hope sums this up is that we give ourselves what we feel we deserve. As human beings, that's what we do. That's our natural state. We give ourselves what we feel we deserve. So we shift the value proposition internally. The world will get more value from us externally. That's just the way it works. This is the Inner Change Maker with Jay Wong, the podcast dedicated to purpose-driven entrepreneurs and multi-passionate individuals. Tune in each week as we bring you an inspiring person and message to help you activate and tap into your inner change maker. Thanks for spending some time with us today and let's get started. Hello, hello, my dear change makers, and welcome to the 2016 edition of the Inner Change Maker. I apologize for taking such a long break from the show, but I'm actually recording in Italy right now for the next couple of weeks, and the internet connection has not been the best. But look, I do not have intentions of starting this year with excuses. I take responsibility for the lack of shows, and I promise to make it up to you guys with greater stories from world-class change makers and more concrete actionable results than ever because that is how we're all going to move forward especially in this year now if you are a first-time listener hearing the show welcome to the inner change maker this is the place dedicated to purpose-driven individuals and passionate creators we're all about impact and choosing legacy over currency today's podcast is is brought to you by Onnit.com. This is the company owned by Joe Rogan and Aubrey Marcus. They have some amazing supplements such as Alpha Brain and various other protein powder supplements, uh, workout gear, etc. So they're all in hopes of making you a little closer to being superhuman. The listeners in the show could get a discount at www.theinnerchangemaker.com forward slash Onnit. And that is the name of the show, dot com forward slash O-N-N-I-T. Now, for our first interview of 2016, we have a man by the name of Philip McKernan. Phil McKernan has coached some of North America's most successful entrepreneurs and has shared the stage with the likes of Richard Branson. Philip is taking the entrepreneurial world by storm. What separates Philip from a lot of coaches and speakers and gurus is really his originality. He brings new conversations to the table, spends a lot of time thinking and challenging the status quo, which, as we all know, is what makes a good change maker. Instead of simply repackaging business and life hacking strategies, Philip really pushes the envelope and pushes ourselves, the listener, to really dig deep. Philip is a modern day philosopher of the human experience. And I had the great pleasure of chatting with him just before the holidays. And we have that recording of the amazing conversation where we do a deep dive on intuition. You know, how do we access our intuition? How do we listen to our intuition? We talk about authentic goal setting, which. I believe is perfect for the timing of this episode. And I know a lot of you guys are hearing this. Maybe it's the first week back from the holidays, right? And let Philip challenge you a bit more. Are you ready to do the things that are not only aligned with what you want to do, but even more importantly, who you are trying to be? And in the episode, Philip gives us a lot of questions we can start asking ourselves. And this is going to be in the middle of the episode. Near the end of the episode, Philip tells us something that he has never shared before on any podcast. And you guys are really 
in for a treat. So please take a listen to the episode slowly and think through some of the content because I promise you it's not the typical surface level stuff information. It has the power to shift your life if you are brave enough to do so. For show notes and links mentioned in the show, please go to my website, www.theinterchangemaker.com and look under the show notes tab. Without any further ado, here is the episode with Philip McKernan. Mr. Philip McKernan, welcome to the show, The Interchange Maker. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I appreciate being, uh, being asked to, to do so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. I know you've been you know, traveling and, and I want to get to, you know, I, I want to get to so many things realistically in, in this time that we have together. But, um, you know, I, I, I remember seeing you speak uh, live and one of our mutual friends, Jason, you know, introduced your work to, to, to us people in Toronto. And I remember running into a friend actually right before the, the event, the Red Shoe Tour, um, if you remember that you were here just like in the summer. Mm. And, um, you know, he, my, my friend, he was like out for a run. He asked me, hey, you know, wh- where are you going? Like, wh- what, are you, what are you doing, uh, you know, so dressed up, you know, going to an event at, you know, 7 p.m. or whatever it was. And, um, you know, I found it really hard to tell him um, what I was going to be in store for because I was only introduced to your work very briefly. And, you know, I found, you know, I know that you said in person that it's always quite difficult sometimes to find the words to answer, you know, the infamous question of what you do. So I thought for this interview, I would actually take it a level deeper. And I'm actually really curious on why you do what you do, what drives you you know, Philip, to do the work that you do that seems so in line with who you are and everything that, that you put out there. Mm, wow. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm actually tearing up, believe it or not. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very rarely stuck for words, but um, I, I, it's, it's just to have the honor, to have the privilege to play a small part in the evolution, the shift in somebody else's existence, where you help them see something within themselves that they never believed existed, like a piece of magic, a gift, um, a piece of alignment, um, opening them up to passion, open them up to relationships that are right in front of their noses, but they have settled in life and they've, they've resigned themselves to this is as good as it gets to open them up to deepening a relationship in them, within their own skin so they can start to improve how they view themselves, how they feel about themselves, not just confidence, much deeper than confidence, like a deeper self-respect, a belief within their own skin that they're capable of not just succeeding in inverted commas like we have, have, have created success in society, but that they are maybe here for something that's bigger than themselves and to play a small part in being a catalyst and, and ruthless in that pursuit, like absolutely ruthless. Sometimes it comes across as edgy, but there's a tremendous amount of compassion for people that I have. So to play a part in that and to hear the feedback, to get a card, to look in somebody's eyes and for them to say, and I have many business owners who have reported much greater income and increases in the, in the revenue streams and all that kind of stuff. And quite frankly, yeah, great, but I don't get any real joy out of that. But when they report back or you see it becoming so evident in the shift or more importantly you hear from other people so for example i literally got a card last week from a spouse of a client who's never done my work has heard me speak maybe once from a spouse saying thank you thank you thank you for the work that you're doing with my husband i literally am living with a different man and different is is a bit weird because people think you know i I change people i don't try to change people i don't want them to transform into something they're not my work is all about opening them up so all of who they are can be seen by the world and that's what i do and that's why i do it because the joy i get from that is just immeasurable it's 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 beyond any wealth that i've ever and any success that i have ever touched in my life up to this point wow um yeah i mean it's uh you know just listening to you kind of talk about this um it's it's you know and and seeing you live and and having the opportunity to kind of hear you um i just think you know Wow, you know, absolutely amazing. Uh, tell us maybe a little bit about your, g- maybe give the audience a little context here. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased because I- I've heard you speak and, and I've seen you live. But, um, you know, you-, you mentioned a couple of times that you weren't actually, or you didn't believe 
you were going to do the work that you're doing now or you, you didn't feel that you were meant to do the work that you're doing now. So maybe give us a little background into maybe how you even got started and, um, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the, the sexy version of the story, which wouldn't be true, would be, <laughs> oh, since I was a young kid, I always visualized doing what I was going to do. And I had a vision board that replicated exactly what I'm doing now. And in fact, it's weird because the similarities are extraordinary. The reality is that that's not the case. The reality is I didn't believe in myself. I had very little confidence as a kid growing up. I mean, I can, and it's not like, you know, blaming my parents or blaming anything else. It was circumstances that surrounded my life. And a lot of that was, and I kind of used the, 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 I used the example of dyslexia where I was, you know, in my mind, stupid. I couldn't read and write, didn't understand why. That was just one of many things where I didn't feel that I belonged in the world. I didn't feel I had a voice in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think if you, if you, if you go and, and you dig into a lot of people who are deeply aligned to doing very meaningful work, I think a lot of them would say that they actually they never saw themselves doing this. And in fact, if you go and, and look at a lot of interviews and talk to a lot of successful sports players, you know, a lot of, a lot of people sometimes, there's a lot more people who never believed they were going to be doing the thing they, they did and what, what it does is when you stop getting overly attached to the outcome, to what you're here to do, what ends up happening is you let go of chasing opportunities. And as I say, you're open to possibilities. And what I mean by that and what the a further extension of that is that often you have people that grasp hold of something and they focus absolutely, completely on the outcome of this, 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 this mountain, this business, this, this career. And they often achieve it, and it's a, it's a misalignment with who they are. In other words, it's not authentically aligned. So I never saw this coming. I mean, I had a different, a different avenue. My goals were about building wealth, building wealth through real estate, and they were my goals. They were the things I thought intellectually that I wanted and needed in order to give myself the freedom in life financially to go and do what makes me happy now. And the mistake I made was... What I was doing was I was giving up on opening that dream and saying, screw the wealth, screw the real estate for the moment. What am I here to do? Why, what, what is the thing that lights me up? What is the gift? Because the talent and the gift are often two very different things in human beings. My talent is this, but what is my gift? What am I open? Like, what am I not open to seeing as my gift? And when I started to have that conversation, that was the scariest time in my life because it, it really brought me to this edge of life. And, um, and thankfully, I found the courage somewhere. And I think the courage I found was through the people that I was helping and supporting and raising. And, um, and then I moved into to doing what I'm doing now. And, and, and honestly, I'll never, ever, ever change from, what, from the path that I'm on right now. How I do it will, will evolve, but where I'm going will, 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 will never stop. For sure. And, and I know I, I've li listened to, I guess, enough talks and, and seen your, your stuff in, in past years that it seems that you're evolving as you're doing the work and and even you know so much of your work is is based on you I, I feel like it's based on your intuition and I, I think your your clientele and, and and people that watch you and hear you they feel the the same way because it's it's almost never the same but you know it's almost like there's this overarching truth of you know you you kind of talked about it with you know discovering your gift and, and being able to kind of present that to the world. Mm. I, it's never the same. I mean, I just had a group of clients. Uh, I literally just got back from Mexico the night before last. And I brought back down there a small group of clients that, that have been with me for a number of years and just see value in staying in the process, see value in, you know, constantly being challenged um, either softly or significantly in their lives to make sure that they're they're tapping into their own intuition that they're not settling in life that they're pushing that bar to make sure that they're not missing anything and I could honestly say that every single one of them coming away from this weekend had a different conversation with me despite being around me for a period of time and I think I owe it to myself number one I owe it to and that and that would that wouldn't be something I would have said Jay a number of years ago. I owe it to myself, number one. I owe it to my family and the people who love me and believe in me and have supported me, number two. And I owe it to my clients, number three. And again, it doesn't feel like they're number three in my life. It feels like it's just all one. To right. to to evolve, to stretch myself as these beautiful men and women are sitting in front of me, stretching themselves, being vulnerable, being open, stretching their their, their, their lives, their businesses, their their existences. I owe it to them to, to keep on my toes and, and, and constantly um, 
you know, when I say constantly, it sounds exhausting, but but be open constantly to what I cannot see and where life can bring me. So yeah, I, I do that, and I, and I and it's part of my evolution and, and the evolution of my work. It's it's shifting. It's it feels like it's it's day, it's shifting literally as I speak right now. I'm glad that the technology in, in 2015 allows us to, you know, record and, and you record your evolution as we go through, you know, this interview. So that's really cool. Um, let's, let's dive in, maybe uh, dive into a few things that you mentioned. Um, I shared with you, maybe, you know, the premise of the show um, is, you know, for people that are listening to the podcast is maybe they're in a transitional period of their life. Maybe they're trying to make a change and, you know, you, you talked about that talent versus gift part. And I think so many times people get held up on, um, you know, what's my purpose? What's my, you know, what are my strengths? And they're trying to kind of, you know, pick out the data, maybe see the, the patterns. Um, maybe explain to us a little bit more of what you mean versus talent, talent versus your gift. How does one kind of intuitively know what their gift is? Well, often we don't intuitively know. I, sorry, my apologies. I'll take that back. We all intuitively know, but often we're not in touch with that intuition and we don't trust that intuition. We haven't given it credence because intuition, let's, let's call it what it really is in societal terms. It's this fluffy word that only monks and Buddhists, and if you lock yourself in a cave for maybe six years, you might get in touch with. And really it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's only related to love and fluffy things in life where it has no real business application. Um, and that, that's what a lot of people believe and, and how mis- deeply mistaken they are because intuition, I mean, I literally saved, sorry, excuse me, a client of mine saved through an intuitive conversation with me, probably $3 million within the last four months. Um, and I can give you countless conversations. I have, I'd say there's a lady the other day who might have saved herself probably in the region of $150,000 from an intuitive conversation. The intellect was telling her to do something completely different, but the intuition was screaming at her to do mm. what is in alignment with who she is. The gift, if I, if I, if I attempted to simplify, I think I can best simplify it by throwing my wife under the bus. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and this is the, the best way I can describe it because it's just, it's, it's real and it's under literally my own roof type of thing. And my wife was, sure. she grew up in a, in a rural area in Ireland. And the dream when you grow up in a rural area of Ireland um, and a lot of rural areas in the, in the world and uh, you don't have a whole lot from a materialistic standpoint and you read and hear about the big cities and the opportunities, often the goal is to literally get out of the area. And I think with respect to her family, that was a goal, a dream and an aspiration of hers. And she was good with numbers, but she had no idea what she wants to do with her life. In other words, she was good with math. And, you know, that was uh, one thing that was evident. So the career guidance person took her aside and said, listen, you don't know what you want to do, but you're really good at maths. And that's a very logical and intellectual way of looking at things. And unfortunately, a way that we've allowed our whole lives to be interpreted by data as opposed to by our hearts or by our souls or by our intuition or by something other than the intellect. And of course, she looked at the data. She looked at him. He was a kind of a senior authority in her life. Her older sister was an accountant. She says, well, why not? And if sure, nothing else changes, sure, I can always go into accountancy and then change it in a few years' time. And she stepped into accountancy. She was pretty good at it. But in my personal opinion, she's the worst accountant in the world. Um, but not because she's bad with numbers and not because she makes mistakes, but because she was never destined to be an accountant. I mean, she is the opposite you, you, you could see from an accountant. Right. So that is her honoring her talent her ability to crunch numbers, her ability to articulate numbers in a way that perhaps I couldn't. But in that space, she shut down, closed down, locked down the possibility that she had something in addition to a talent, and that is a gift, a way of connecting with people, a way of opening people up, a way of speaking to others, coaching others, whatever you want to call that. And that, to me, is also the mistake that I made for many, many, many years of my life where people said, oh, you're great at sales or you're great at marketing or whatever. And of course, I trusted right. and I followed that. And it seemed to make me money and it seemed to be outlining and unfolding this career. But I was ignoring the gift that I believe every single human being has. And that to me is a very simple example and I can give you many. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I definitely 
you know, see the distinction there, but it's, it's obviously, you know, I could share with you even in, in starting this podcast and doing some of the, the work that I do now. And, and, you know, sometimes I go speak at high schools and, and universities, and I'm just trying to, you know, tell them that, you know, just share my story and tell them that I, I overcame fear. Um, it's not something that you kind of, you know, just overcome and you're done with it, but I do it on a daily basis because I want to share this message with the world. Um, but you know, so much of before I was doing this work, um, I went through a very similar thing where people, you know, business school, society, what have you, everyone, you know, tries to tell you, Oh, you're, you're great at sales. You're great at marketing. And it's, it is very difficult to kind of, it's almost like you, you want to not neglect your gift. Um, but you want to have also the, you feel like you want to have the money side as well so that you could kind of support your dream. Do you believe that maybe it's you? It's kind of like this process um, that you do have to kind of go through for yourself, where you do make, you know, you do achieve a certain level of success, maybe financially, what have you, um, before you kind of activate your gift. Or can people really just jump towards activating their gift and just finding way to contribute back into that? I think I think it's shifting that people are not going through the middle step of 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 you know activating the piece where they f- become financially stable or free or whatever terminology they want to use um, and and sometimes people need to spend those three to five to ten or in some cases forty five years to to realize that actually the financial thing um, it wasn't the answer to it. In fact, they've actually put their dream and their aspirations on hold in the interim. I'm not saying there's a right way or a wrong way. I do yeah. believe, though, there's a way of actually leaning into your gift before you feel the need to. Um, I think we give money way too much respect. I think we put it on a pedestal. And many of the dialogues and the conversations that I have with people is really driven by money. Well, where do you want to live? San Francisco. Well, where do you now live in the boonies? Well, why do you <laughs> live in San Francisco? Well, because it's too expensive. Um, you know, why do you want your kids to go to school? Because I want them to have a, a, you know, an opportunity to get a good job and get well paid. And um, you know, I want to, I want to live my dream, but I don't want to give up what I have. I want to keep the same amount of income coming in. So money drives a lot. I know there's people rolling their eyes now saying you need money and whatever. Well, you don't need money. You don't need any money. Actually, technically you don't, you know, you, you, you know, people just put so much credence on the, on the financial piece. And the minute they look through their dreams and aspirations through a, a lens of money, it's certain it's it, it automatically distorts reality it distorts the possibility and i know i did that for years myself for years and years and years i'm going to give you one of the quick example but the other thing is that we've got to be very cognizant of is not just societal expectations business school expectations or even our own expectations right the one that we have to be most cognizant of is our parental or the people around us our loved ones their expectations upon us and it's not often by what they say it's often by what they don't say so the person that we're very familiar with is the father that their kid runs up to and says daddy 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 i want to be a policeman well, that's a loser's job. And that's the abrupt, arrogant you know, person that we all hate in society or point the finger at or whatever. But there's no difference, in my opinion, than the kid that runs up to his daddy, 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 or mommy, 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 I want to be a policeman. Oh, yeah, that, that'd, be, that'd be great. Yeah, that, yeah, that'd be great. They've said the same thing. They're basically saying is, I don't accept that. I don't want you to do that. That's not good enough in my eyes, irrespective of why they're saying it, because they can rationalize and justify that they're only saying it because they want their kid to be safe. They're only saying it because they want their kid to dream bigger. And they're only saying it because they want the best for their kids. And that's bullshit. That's the societal line that we use and we justify and squashing the crap out of our kids' dreams. We're saying it primarily because we're being self-driven, because we don't want our kids to live the lives that we did. We don't want our kids to play small like we did. We don't want our kids to give up on their dreams and their aspirations often like we did. And I have a situation literally in front of my eyes at the moment with a beautiful guy who's a talent. I mean, this guy is beyond a rock star in the context of what he does. And it's an an artistic expression. And his father um, comes from from a very academic background and followed the whole dream of going to college and getting a job and everything else. But he's not necessarily happy in his own skin. And now what he's choosing to do is living vicariously through his son. And now he wants his son to follow the same academic path that he did, the same career path that he did, even though it didn't work out and he's not particularly happy, and to close down 
the dream and the gift that this man has. And it's evident to everybody around him. But what his father has not done is his father has not dealt with his own story, his own bitterness, his own frustration around his, his, his aspirations or lack of aspirations or his, his own inability to pull off his own dream. And his son is caught in the middle because his son wants to keep his dad happy. And his son is about to give up potentially this amazing, incredible, not just opportunity to, to, to live a dream, to affect millions of people, but to make shitloads of money doing it. That's the irony here, to follow his father's path, which didn't really work out for his father, but that's all his father knows. And I think we have a moral obligation as parents in this world, if we have kids, to work on our shit to realize what we're projecting onto our children by what we do and what we do not do. What would you say, I mean, I, I know you've talked about, you know, authentic goal setting before, and I feel like, you know, so much of these societal um, or parental, uh, parental kind of views is based off of, you know, we believe that we need to achieve a certain goal so that we could be, you know, euphoric or happy or joyous or, you know, we've achieved this great thing. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about the, you know, how we don't do goal setting properly because I could see the scenario playing out for a lot of the listeners that are maybe, you know, listening to this in the car, going to work, um, because, you know, they've, you know, we're very good at achieving these goals. Um, but it, you say it might not be aligned with what we're really trying to, to do, or it might not be aligned with what our gift is. Yeah. I mean, goal setting at its very core isn't, isn't this process of visualizing and attempting to predict the future or, or creating an outcome that you want to achieve. I think it's at a deeper fundamental level. It's, it's all about control. And I think we've, we, we live in a society that we want to control everything and we're not in control of anything. I mean, really, when you break it down, we're not in control of anything. Right. And, and often, you know, people will, again, justify and rationalize, <clears throat> excuse me, and historically, we blame the poor women of, of, the, of the world and, and wives, like, oh, my wife just wants to feel security. Well, that's not the case. Your wife, or you, is so driven to have security because you're driven by an insecurity, a deep insecurity within your own skin. So the more security you need, the more insecure you are in your own skin. The more that you need a relationship to validate your life, the more that you're not comfortable in your own skin. The more that you need money to prove that you're happy, the more misaligned you are to your, your, your calling, to your gift, etc. I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, I've tiptoed around this a little bit to some extent, but I think honestly, as a society, I think we should all just unplug, the, unplug goal setting completely. And the challenge with that is people, again, probably just about to turn off the radio now or turn off the show or whatever <laughs> because they, how, how outrageous of a statement is that? Because it's been proved that when you set an intention to go and get something, that you have a higher likelihood of achieving it because your focus, your energy, your mental energy, your physical energy, your, your team, everything starts to conspire to achieve that thing. And I don't disagree with that part of it. But why are we so controlled with the outcome? Why are we so controlled with what's happening in the future? The minute you set an intention, the minute you create a goal, you're dragging yourself out of the present and you're into the future. And it's not where we know in terms of not just research, not just science, but we know within our own skins that constantly living in the future doesn't serve us. Constantly living in the past doesn't serve us. So we want to have this balance where we spend as much time as we can in the moment. But the bigger thing here is that we create goals from a place of intellect, historically, typically, because we live in our heads a lot. And when we create goals up there, we create goals that we think we want, that we think we need, that we think will make us happy, that we think will make us look good. And it's driven a lot by ego and so on and so forth, fears and inadequacies. And often it's about doing the opposite of the past. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to repeat that. I'm not going to be my dad. I'm not going to be my mother. So all of these things are influencing how we set goals. But do we feel the goal? In other words, it's the difference between, forget what you do and who you do it to. Why do you do the work you do, Philip? That was the question you start. Why do you do this? And that yeah. to me is, if you start digging into the why, what ends up happening is with most people's goals, you'll undermine the goals. You'll actually prove that their substance attached to the goals is is weak and typically the goals are 100 properties a million dollars 10 million a billion dollar turnover <laughs> all of these round numbers why do you think they're round because they're easy to remember because there's no substance around them so you know and honestly if i if i achieved all the goals that i had set out years ago my vision board i wouldn't be talking to you today 
I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I guarantee you that. I have a multi-million dollar real estate business. And there's people out there that they, 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 they're, not, they're not open to this conversation. They cannot be open to this conversation because it exposes them. And the conversation they're having right now is they're rolling their eyes in their car and going, yeah, but maybe you'd be happier. Maybe, maybe you'd be in a better place. Maybe then you'd have enough money to sustain yourself the rest of your life, and then you could go and do what you're already doing on the side. That's all great, but that's not what happens. When you get lost in building a multi-million dollar real estate business like that, it becomes who you are. It becomes an, ex an extension of who you are. Your identity gets caught up on it. And I know intuitively that I'm not making as much money as perhaps I could be if I did my business differently or if I had a multi-million dollar real estate business. But I also know in my core that I'm one of the wealthiest men in the planet because I am so deeply aligned to what I'm here to do on this planet. And very few people can say that. So, Philip, I mean, you, you, I definitely you know, agree with, with so many of the, the points you you said there it's almost like people you know especially when you know they they think of success they uh, you know they think of the money the cars what have you maybe the clothes and, and then it becomes this kind of cycle that they're just jumping from you know it's never kind of enough right when exactly. when is it enough we're we're always kind of trading up you know now you're hanging out with a, maybe a different network everyone is a little wealthier maybe this one person you know the, decided to you know buy a, a ferrari and so now it's not enough to have a car you know, now it's not enough to just, you know, drive a, a I don't know, a BMW or whatever. You have to kind of work for the Ferrari. So it's kind of like you're stuck in that lifestyle of just achieving these goals and these material possessions that really don't serve you or align with you at the end of the day. I, I'm just really curious, though. Do you think that people, you know, they they have this sense of their gift, they have this sense of their their goals do you think that they could kind of just flip it on and take action towards their gift? Is it really that simple in layman's terms? Yeah, but let's not give them, people don't want to hear the answer that it's simple. So let's complicate it. If we, <laughs> if we could just spend that, but in essence, yes. And, and I'm not suggesting that you need to give up the current business that you have and, 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 and the financial income that you have to, to honor the gift piece. Um, I mean, but, you know, I, 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 what I don't want to do is get the message lost in this. It's almost like coming across as bashing people who have money or people who want money or people who are very wealthy. I've got very wealthy clients. Right. But very, very wealthy clients on paper. But often they don't know who they are. They don't have an identity. They have caught up. They've lost themselves in what they do. And they've forgotten to discover who they are. And... There, when, when that happens and they start to open up to who am I at the core, because that's a conversation most people never have, the materialism and the wealth just doesn't become as significant. It doesn't mean they have to they write, write a check and give it all away to Red Cross in order to free themselves of this burden. But often their relationship and the pressure they're under to be something is insurmountable and they're, and they're lost in all of it. And they're not aligned. Often they're lonely. Often very successful people are deeply lonely. They've got people all around them and they're cutting checks and they're buying dinners and, they're, and they're, they're hanging out with people. But at some level, they feel lonely. And they're so, they're so recognized in society for the successful piece that, like to say, a soccer player or, or, a, or a business person, they're so deeply recognized and put on a pedestal for the success they have in society that they start leaning more and more into that successful piece of their lives like the piece that's in the media, the piece that's on the podcast. And what we don't see is how they are in their marriages, how they are in their own skin, how they are with their children. And that to me is often the place that they neglect in order to pursue the maximum element or evolution of, of success that they can on paper or on the pitch or on the ice or whatever it happens to be. And, and often when you know, they get old enough, they realize, holy shit, I've neglected very important aspects of my life, which are a much more fun representation of who they are, as opposed to the business and the gold medals and the, the cups that they won or whatever the hell it happens to be. So I deal with celebrities, I deal with sports athletes, I deal with billionaires, I deal with, I deal with people who have no money, who want to start a business, startups, I deal with couples. So I have this spectrum right across the board, and I'm telling you, the same principles apply to the billionaires and to the no millionaires. The same principles apply, the same challenges. Wow. So, uh, uh, Philip, so 
you know, you talk about how, you know, it, it needs, you know, it can't just be that simple. It needs to be kind of a little complicated. But now that we've kind of, you know, painted this this picture that maybe, you know, they're questioning some of their own goals now and maybe they're questioning or just looking at, you know, where they are in life and where they are in this current stage. What are maybe, you know, some things that they could, you know, maybe some questions or some, you know, I don't want to use the word tactic, just kind of like, you know, throw a Band-Aid on, you know, the, the solution, or, you know, try to throw a Band-Aid on, on the problem. But what are some things that they could do to maybe start being proactive in that process of getting themselves to, you know, show them to kind of highlight their gift more and more? Yeah, I mean, I think they need to get in touch with the reality. So you might have somebody today who's got a successful business, but they're listening to this podcast because they're curious. They're listening to this podcast because at some level they know something's just not congruent. And they're just not sure. And, and fear is stifling them and the uncertainty is stifling them. A lack of clarity is stifling them. Well, if I knew what my gift was, well, then I go and do it. But I don't know what it is. So let's just rock on for another 10 years and, and right, then right, right. actually appear um, maybe in a, in a fortune cookie or something like that. And that's just not the way it works. So I think number one is that we need to get real on our current reality and be open to the fact that perhaps the lives that we're, ex- that we're in right now, the businesses that we're in, the relationships that we're in, the cities that we live in, the cars that we drive, the, 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 the clothes that we wear are not really that deeply in alignment with who we are. And that might sound like a negative conversation. I find it might sound like a, an undermining conversation. And so be it if it is. But like all I'm asking to do is to unveil the current reality, the truth of their existence. So for example, beautiful questions, stunning questions, as I call them, stunning questions can unlock people. But I can give a great question to somebody, to three different people. One person is open beyond belief. They just want the truth. The other person is a little bit guarded, but they know they're missing something. The other person is in complete denial. And the three questions will land at different places, one in the soul, one in the mind, and one in the heart somewhere, you know, in terms of just, you know, the physicality of the body. In other words, the depth in which they'll allow the question to go um, will determine, you know, how open they are. Because people often don't want the truth. They don't want to know that they're not leaning with their gift. They don't want to know that the person they're sleeping in, in the bed next every single night is not really the person for them. They don't want to know and they don't want to admit that the business that they've set up and spent five years developing is the wrong business they, they, they don't want the truth and and yet they put their hand up and they take up most of the oxygen in the room they go i want to grow i want to be happier i want the strategies and everything else but they don't want they want the strategies but they don't want the truth and and and, and what i say to those people is respectfully just just if you don't mind just step into the left or step into the right because there's a person right behind you with their hand up who really wants to make a change um so for example how happy am i really in my life right now is this really the work that I'm destined to do? What part of my life do I not? I'm just making these up, by the way. I'm not reading them in yeah. words. <laughs> what part of my life do I not want to see? What part of myself am I not allowing the world to see? I ask, really, don't ask, what do I need to be happy? What do I need to change in my life to bring more abundance in? There are bullshit questions that are on the surface that have never served humanity and are never going to serve humanity. What do I not see in my own existence? What am I afraid of? What, 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 what am I here to, not to do, but what am I here to give? What part of my story can enlighten other people? I'm just, I'm just random questions that, like, you know, there's, there's a, there's, I could give you a million questions if I sat down and really thought about it. But these are questions that can really unlock you. So, for example, if a group of clients come to me, sometimes I'll say, what do you want to talk about? And they write down something very quick. And I say, what is the conversation you don't want to have today? They like cr- cringe and crawl in their own skin. Right. It's up to them. I don't force anybody. Mm-hmm. And it's often the greatest growth is the conversation they do not want to have. What are the conversations that you're not having in life? You know, you know Jay, it was about, about three or four weeks ago I was in India. And I'm walking through the Himalayas. And it was a full moon. We just happened to land the perfect time. We're looking over the Himalayas. The Ganges is just coming out of the, the mountains in the distance and all this kind of stuff, right? And we've had the most extraordinary couple of weeks. And I just find myself listening into some of the conversations. And I love these people. These are my clients. So, you know, take this, um, you know, with, with a degree of respect. And I said it to them. I just stopped the group and I said, guys, I may never be here again. You may never be here again. We've, both, we've just been through a soul-opening process, a heart-opening process, a mind-bending process. And are you telling me these are the conversations that you want to have on this mountain? These one-time and band camp conversations 
about my air conditioning in my new car is not working quite right. Yeah, you know, the Starbucks uh, just beside me. Yeah, you know, they're 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 not making the coffee the, the way they. I, I, is this really the conversation you want to have right now? We spend so much time as human beings having stupid conversations that are irrelevant to ourselves and humanity, and we don't even realize how often we're having them. Who cares about, do you want to sit in the Himalayas and actually have no conversation and just contemplate the existence of your life and what part of your life you're so deeply attached to because it offers a convenience you don't have to see what you're capable of. 